Hello and welcome to Queen of the Bull in the post-truth apocalypse. I'm Ben and as always I'm hanging out with Mike, Hello. Claire hey. and Pete. Hello. Today we are going to talk about medieval medicine. Cool. The leech. <laughs> That's it. The show's done. <laughs> okay. There we go. Now there's more to it than that. Some, very, some kind of sophisticated stuff, actually. Yeah, I know. Some that still works today, yeah. It's quite amazing, yeah. really, isn't you it? You know, they were on to some things, but it was... Uh, a lot of it was bullshit. Hmm. But a lot of it was all right. Eating lead and things like that. Mercury. Yeah. yeah. We'll get into it. Let's thank some new returning listeners, and then I will address the massive, glaring elephant in the room that anyone from the UK cannot get away from for the next ten days. That was so cheeky. I'll get to. I'll give it its due respect in a moment. I'm just saying it's a bit of an elephant in the room. We're in the UK. He wasn't it's all everyone's you, talking about. <laughs> so I thought you were talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the new address to returning listeners, and we will address it. Edinburgh in the UK, Federal Way in Washington. Oh God, I hope that's the fucking NSA. Cape Town, South Africa, Frankfurt and Maine in Germany, Stevenage in the UK. High Wycombe in the United Kingdom. We've got quite a lot of UK listeners in there today. That's not just High Wycombe, there's a few others. Phoenix, Arizona, Ireland, Texas, Dublin, Ireland. Milton Regis in the United Kingdom. Bengaluru in India. Riga, Latvia. Montreal, Canada. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque. Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You're new. Hello. Guadalajara, Spain. And Ashburn, Virginia. Thank you to everyone that's new and returning. And please tell your friends, tell several friends, tell your mistress, tell your girlfriend, tell your new mom. Not at the same time, because you might get in trouble for that. Not at the same time. <laughs> so at the old toast, you know, may your wives and girlfriends have a meet. <laughs> so yes, obviously, we are recording this on the Saturday after Queen Elizabeth died, so I'm going to say the one line I've always wanted to say, because I'll never get to say it for real. The Queen is dead. Long live the King. Long live the king. I've always wanted to say that. It's a great line, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's normally be, I'm the not king a royalist. is dead. Long live the yeah. king. <laughs> I'm not a royalist, but I appreciate the historical importance of that one line. And now I've got to say it. I'm happy. Right, you guys can do the rest of us sitting in smoke. <laughs> I for the monarchy, I say. Rest in peace, Elizabeth II. I have what, sympathy. What an absolute legend. She was, really, 96 years old and... Longest reigning monarch in our history. I've got sympathies for the grieving family, mm. but I'm with Claire, I don't believe there should be a monarchy. Not in the 21st century. It's too no, outdated. Um, just to put a slightly negative spin on it, when you think that we have people that are struggling, but we're going to fork out a lot of money for a funeral and a lot of money for a coronation. Yeah. That magic money tree, if you shake it hard enough, all of a sudden you can get billions. That'll already be in her. They'll already have a pot for that anyway. They'll, they'll have their own pot that's saved up for that. It's yeah, our it's money though, isn't it? In a roundabout way, yeah. Well, it is. It's, it's going to be taxpayer funded. They ain't going to pay for it. Well, that's how where they get their revenue anyway, isn't it, really, that's essentially? It. It's also where you give that revenue to pay off your paedophile son's accuser. But, you know, RIP Liz. You were there for a long time, not a good time. <laughs> I think she was there for a good time. She got four kids. Well, she did. <laughs> she she had a good time too, let's face it. Privileged life that many, many people yes, will yes, never let's, know. Let's, you know. The woman's dead. Let's not bash her too much. Let's not oh. bash her. She's just show a bit of decorum. R.I.P. Yeah. R.I.P.D. I was always there told. There you go. You get the full D. If you can't say anything nice, don't say nothing at all. So we'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Medieval I, medicine. I used to medieval work for medicine. So, like I said, I have respect. So R.I.P. Oh, I genuinely mean that. <laughs> Medieval medicine, then. Yes. Let's talk about that. Bloody. <laughs> yeah. Well, most of it was bleeding, wasn't it? So, you know, when you get to you know, the Dark Ages, which is the early medieval period, or just before the early medieval period, there was very little hope for life expectancy, education, or a meaningful work life, and it was a miserable time, and most people were uneducated and superstitious. And around the year 500 AD, you've kind of got open fighting in the in the societies between the pagans and the Christians because Christians are coming in big time and the pagans are kind of becoming less and less mm. mm-hmm. Christians are converting England and then we end up in the middle medieval period once England's been colonised by Saxons against the early medieval period 
So, so yeah, so we look at that medieval times. Just before William conquered England, so eight hundred eight hundred to nine hundred AD for early period. Maybe even a bit later than that. So eight hundred to let's say ten sixty six roughly. For early. And then onwards you go to about fourteen hundred for middle, and then you get the Renaissance in the late medieval period. That's when the sixteen hundreds is it? The fifteen something or other. So it covers about six, seven hundred years then. Oh yeah. Why? Absolutely. Obviously, you yeah, know, we learn a lot. A lot of wars were fought during the medieval period, so there's a lot of chance to practice medicine. Also, disease is very, very rife. Mm. You know, we've obviously got the major plague outbreak in Europe, which killed like a third of all Europeans. The major one. And it's like, well, you know what? There's a lot of opportunity to practice on people, isn't there? Yeah. Well, that, that, they learn things and there's a lot of wars going on. I just always liked the uniform. The plague doctor uniform? Yeah. Man. Actually, just to, to briefly diverge about that mask, it is a really sensible mask. For a start, no one's coughing on you. Your eyes are sort of gauzed. The thing in the nose holds sweet herbs. So you're not smelling... You smell the putrid so you're smell not, of death. You can't smell the putrid smell of death. But it's also they thought that an inhaled thing, so the herbs would stop it. But even so, so you've got like a modern day respirator, your face is covered, your mouth's covered. It's a really sensible idea for a mask to what their understanding of how that disease was spread. Yeah, they didn't for know a different it was reason, wasn't it? But yeah, they didn't know it was spread by fleas or they all thought it was the miasma that crept in over the moors. Mm. Like a hazy fog. I don't know, I went into a sailor then. Uh. <laughs> Medieval healthcare, at the start certainly, is simply misinformed people practicing medicine on ignorant people <laughs> using barbaric primitive mythology and misguided beliefs about hermal remedies and healing spirits. But we'll get past that. So, from creepy witch doctors and poisonous plants to bloody procedures and devastating diseases, let's delve a bit deeper. It's worth pointing out that when Christianity came in, you lost a lot of herbal medicine knowledge because those wise women in the woods who were pagans... Uh, the wise women? All got the wise women. And got killed. They were, exactly, they were accused of being witches and they yeah. were killed. The druids were wiped out. You lost a lot of sort of herbal knowledge and things like that, so it did set medicine back a bit. Yeah, it sent medicine back a lot, I reckon. Probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, I reckon. Well, if you never had 500 years of Christian Dark Age, you imagine how far we'd be. Yeah. We probably have a lot less disease in the world. Well, we'd just be five hundred years more advanced, yeah. wouldn't we? It used to say what we've done in five. We, we've come a long way in the last five hundred years. So. We'd just be able to cope with them better. Yeah. yeah, doctors of the Middle Ages weren't exactly doctors. Medieval medicine was based largely on inaccurate theories like humorism, and that's the the belief that the human body had to keep four internal fluids in equilibrium for good health, and those fluids are. Blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. If you've got one of them and not enough of the other, you'll be sick. So they will take appropriate measures, probably bleeding you in all fairness, to relieve the pressure. So humorism is the humoral theory, a system of medicine detailing a supposed makeup and workings of the human body, adopted by the ancient Greek and Roman physicians and other philosophers. And it only began to fall out of favour in the 1850s <laughs> with the advent of germ theory, which is able to show that many diseases thought to be humoral were in fact caused by microbes. So the 1850s, for all the way from ancient Greece and Hippocrates... Why? And weren't things like that discovered from rotting foods and that, wasn't it? Like, all that, like penicillin and things, it was all... Hippocrates, bread, people yeah. realised that mould wasn't just there was more to it and things like that and then they started to realise that things well, were exa- Alexander and Fleming germs and well Alexander Fleming wasn't it invented penicillin and that was basically from the advent of mouldy bread mm-hmm. when he discovered that oh well, you know what that's actually killed that germs oh mm-hmm. fantastic all of a sudden life saving drug right there mm. but so the 1850s people said oh well you know what better bleed me what, too much black bile? What was this black bile? It's just it's one of the humours of you. They think your body's made up. But it was, made, it was a made-up thing, because 
we don't have black bile in our bodies. There's bile in your body. There's even there's yellow bile. There's black. There's got to be some black bile in there somewhere. If it's black bile, I'm assuming that would be more disease inside you. So you might be looking at cancer with that. Well, what you'd probably find is it's old blood. It's not black bile, it's old blood or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, Hippocrates was basically one of the first, well, the, the first doctor yeah. to sit there and actually observe what was happening with the patients, write down what worked, what didn't work, what he'd done, and try to build case studies. I met him. Hippocrates? Yeah. 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 On Assassin's Creed. I met him on Assassin's Creed as well. Yeah. He had to go and get his medical tools for yeah, a fortress man. for some reason. Sound bloke, actually. He's all right, isn't he? Bit crackers. You got to call him bored, though. He gets annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> but you wonder where he got that four humours from. Yeah. Because it, it's just sort of plucked out of the air, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's an imagination thing. Yeah. But yeah. It, that's because infections were, were bad before. I mean, and then for, for two thousand years, it's considered. But until Go penicillin, to guide. <laughs> you know I mean? until penicillin, all you really had to keep wounds not getting infected was looking was like was changing, washing them and changing the bandages every day. Yeah. Well, not just that they would stuff it up with plant and things like that, mm. wouldn't they? They'd like be certain leaves Moss. chew up and stick on it just to bind it and close the wound mm. and things and yeah, not nice. Yeah, so obviously they're using the humorism system. So they rarely ever treated diseases as one entity. Instead, they treated each symptom, such as a cough or a fever, separately. And this meant patients often took more than one toxic remedy, and the cycle continued when the remedy itself caused new symptoms. Mm -hmm. Here, take this arsenic. It should cure that cough. (laughs) When someone became ill in the Middle Ages, the type of medical professional, quote, who helped them largely depended on their location. Now, monks, especially Benedictine monks, commonly practiced medicine. And in large cities at university, there were specially trained physicians and medical guilds. So, you know, if you got a bit of money, maybe you can. He looks like he's getting his penis cut off. He probably is. Uh, <laughs> you got a headache, cut your cock off. <laughs> That'll fix it. Now, if a physician isn't available, there were three types of surgeons. The best was an educated surgeon, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Rose which ended a scalpel to old, followed by a craft surgeon. I assume they're like a home trained surgeon. And then a barber surgeon who's even more of a home trained surgeon, but he'll cut your hair after. And I, give you a shave. I was picturing Baldrick as the third choice. <laughs> <laughs> and the third choice, the servant. <laughs> They've got a very rich heritage. It goes back to the Dark Ages. For centuries, societies relied on barber surgeons to provide the care and treatments that physicians wouldn't. First recognised around 1000 AD, Hmm. barber surgeons were considered the medical and grooming experts (laughs) in Europe throughout the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. But that was basically because they had a cutthroat razor and they could bleed you. Yes. That was their medical yeah. knowledge. Was it doesn't take your leg off. Well, yeah, yeah. Affected, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that was basically their doctorate was, I have a very sharp knife, I can cut you, and you will bleed and release the pressure. Yeah. Because for years they believed that was the cure for almost every ailment. Relieve the pressure. Yeah, because I should imagine back in the day they'd seen pustules or some sort of boils over the bodies and relieving the pressure on them and getting and the... it's worked. It's worked. <laughs> well, it's worked they? on that. It'll work on everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Fully That's enough, I mean, draining the pus from the Bew boys during the Black Plague was something that was considered like, wow, that's a bit far out. Was it? Yeah, there was a surgeon who kept as a doctor, or physician, sorry, who kept himself alive doing that, caught the plague. Whenever the Bew was, would come up, he'd lance them. Yeah. And before, it was like, oh, no, I better leave them, don't know what them are. Because they're going to burst anyway. Yeah. But he lancing them early prevented further infection. Still, like, fucked him up, but he survived. Hmm. Early barber surgeons found their homes in the monasteries of Europe. Due to strict regulations, both religious and sanitary, monks were required to keep a shaved head. As a result, each monastery had to train or hire a barber surgeon to take care of grooming and medical procedures. The process of bloodletting, for example, 
Uh, obviously, withdrawal of blood from a patient to cure or prevent illness and disease practiced by monks was passed on to the barber surgeons, thus cementing them within the surgical field. Mm. Now, bar- so it was the monks' fault yeah. then. <laughs> so sort of bloody monks. <laughs> you know, my nan used to tell me that nuns used to steal children. Probably did. You know, they used to hide them under the long robes and spirit them away to be Catholic. How else would they get new girls into the monastery? <laughs> yeah, well. If they get a boy with a mistake, they just pass it on to the priest. <laughs> yeah, the R is, it is a little sex toy for you. Until he becomes a monk. So. Until, he, until he becomes a monk, which is why he takes the vow of celibacy. <laughs> I'm never fucking doing that again. <laughs> no, because abu- the abused can become abusers, can't they? That's Most often in, Especially do, yeah. if it's institutionalised. Mm. Yep. Like the monasteries. Let's not assume that every monastery practiced that, eh? Only 90%. Only some of them, allegedly. Mm. So barbers who had a knack for handling sharp instruments, such as scissors and razors, assisted in bloodletting for the sick. And as the profession progressed, barber surgeons, not doctors, were charged with conducting surgical operations and looking after soldiers during and after battle. Like I say, a lot of wars in the Middle Ages. A lot of wars. A lot of blunt force trauma weaponry. A lot of stabby weaponry. A lot of shooty, pointy weaponry. At least they all had nice hair. Barbers? (laughs) They were all fucking immaculately groomed. I'll tell you what, though. Barbers, when you think about it, have always been at the top of the fucking food chain as far as making probably money for a business goes. Because barbers nowadays cost you, what, 15 quid for a fucking short back and sides? So, mate, I've been for, doing hairdressing for, for 21 years. <laughs> for 20 minutes' work, they make 15 quid, yeah? They do two, three of them an hour, 30, 45 pounds an hour. Happy fucking days. So, you think how many, if they were also a doctor as well, Jesus Christ. So, they've always been minted, them barbers. I remember those simple things like pulling a tooth might cost you like a penny. Genuinely, obviously the price goes up the more that you want doing, but mm. simple something like pulling a tooth, yeah, cheap enough, pliers in, here's some brandy. Let's just look at the Reference. anaesthetic for a second. Like, there isn't any. You either get fucking hammered or have a blow to the head. And I say, if you're sensible, you'll do both. <laughs> get hammered, then have the blow to the head. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. You That's like your the, options, isn't it? Um, I at could, this I, point. I'm just imagining the price chart. Short back and sides, fifteen pounds. Headache in the same bracket, fifteen pounds. Short back and sides or headache, fifteen pounds. Beard yeah. trim or tooth pull, <laughs> two pound fifty. In the early versions of the Hippocratic Oath, cautioned physicians from practicing surgery due to their limited knowledge on its invasive nature. Christianity again forbid dissection. So it wasn't until a lot later when you started to get a few rebels that human anatomy became to be known. And we're talking sort of the circulatory system wasn't known to the Renaissance when sort of things loosened up a little and people, you know, profound intellectuals of their day were like, well, how the fuck do we work? Started doing this shit in secret to start with because the church would hunt them down and obviously kill them. Yeah. Or arrest them, certainly. But when did all those old anatomy books start coming out where, you know... The middle medieval, high medieval period, you start getting... People are starting to learn again. People are getting slightly more educated About again. 14, 1500s. It's not just the monasteries that are educating people now. You're, starting to get, you're getting universities building up in cities, so people are starting to yeah. get educated again. Universities at the time, and during the Renaissance, did not provide education on surgery, which was deemed as a low trade of manual nature. <laughs> <laughs> not important, that. No. They, they lived to like 40 anyway, so what is the point? Well, that's another thing, isn't it? You've got your lower life expectancy anyway. Most surgery probably results in the they're, patient dying on the table. They're not low life expectancy because they treat medicine and health as a low well, no, they're, trade. It's, it's, they just don't know enough about it as well. They can't dissect bodies. They can't get to the root of things. Yeah, but if they did provide some education, rather than just letting... Oh, well, the barber surgeons are care of it, doesn't matter. They're trained, aren't they? Just shows you though how things have progressed. Yeah, how long does it take to become a surgeon now? Oh god, ten years. Yeah, there you go. Good few years. I'd rather have that than nothing at all. Yeah. Just a local idiot with a pair of scissors and a fucking knife. You know what I mean? Well, I'll cut lying. your hair while I slit your veins. But he's been 
lancing boils and warts for ages. Yeah, and remember, none of that stuff's getting washed. No, yeah. that's the infection that's pretty much kills you. They don't know about that, remember? They might wash them if they get too grubby. He might take off Still two a bit of the day. this one, I'll just rinse it off. You know, if he's got a sore, he's got to, he's, you know, he's got to take your leg off. He might have done two legs this morning. But he had not washed it. Oh, by the way, a medieval surgeon, five minutes for an amputation on your leg. One minute of that is the actual cutting, and the other four minutes, sorting the flap of skin out, stitching that, cauterizing the wound, all of that. Five minutes. Ooh, I'd have a piece of hot metal anyway, just to... Oh, they did. Like you have like an, an, iron. A, an iron on the fire, but it's a brand new. Cauterization was, we'll get into that, but it was really, that was like a, you had an open wound to cauterize it. That was, that was pretty much it. Well, if it was cauterise it and take your chances or bleed to death, you're going to go with cauterise it, aren't you? Well, of course, yeah. Exactly. That's, that's, that, was, that was what they did to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. Kills infection as well. That's it. There you have a burn, which is also susceptible to infection. Yeah. It's keeping that clean afterwards, yeah. Mm. But alongside the barber surgeon, they did have specialised practitioners like midwives, dentists and eye doctors. Although they still had witches and wise men, which were also present to recommend herbs. Yeah, you know, they lived in the woods. They're the remnants of what was left of the old ways. The old ways. They would always be at the black market, wouldn't they? And they're obviously like black markets. Yeah, the hermits and that, yeah. The hermit black market? Yeah. Trading herbs. Yeah. Herbs and spices. Going under, under the radar of the prostitutes. We're just living away at a town when, and there's only like, the, you know, the peasants go and see them. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they were originally called Herbits, not Hermits. Herbits. Herbits, yeah. Hmm. Right, let's, let's move on to some of the <laughs> common cures, as Pete said, so and we've all said, as Pete mentioned. Bloodletting. It's a cure-all in medieval Europe, that is. Got a cold? Let your blood. The practice has its origins in ancient India and Greece and it continued into the Middle Ages. And that's when the task was as designated the barber surgeons. That's where you get the red stripe on the barber pole. It represents the blood. And the oh. bandages. Never? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to the barbers next time and say, just hold my arm out. Like that. Bob, let me please. I'm not, uh, I'm not feeling too hot <laughs> today. Just, uh, just don't mind bleeding me while you do my beard, would you? You've got the sign outside that says you do it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, a lot of them apply blue to it now for some reason. For royals only. Mm. Yeah. God damn them. <laughs> <laughs> so the blood was drawn by either puncturing a vein or applying leeches. Barber surgeons used bloodletting to treat gangrene, insanity, leprosy, gout, cholera, plague, scurvy, tuberculosis and even acne. It was believed that bloodletting balanced the four humours of the body. Again, black bile, phlegm, yellow bile and blood. It's just worth pointing out, everyone, just in case, uh, listeners, if you do feel that you, you're ill and you feel like letting your blood... Please don't. Don't, because it's now considered completely ineffective at treating any of those diseases. It's really? just called self-harming now. Although leeches are coming back. They prevent blood clots. Leeches are still used. Yeah, they are, yeah. In, in lots of countries, even our country, leeches are used for certain things. There yeah. are, there are leech, leech farms. A, a leech yeah. on a dirty big spot might work out. Can think? Well, it would suck out the... Um, I don't know if it would suck it out because it's pussy. There's one thing on pussy, it wants blood. Mm -hmm. it just prevents gotta, blood clots. you got to pop a, you gotta pop a spot, Claire. <laughs> and those are the pimple popping sides going to keep going. <laughs> what I do, get a bit of soap, lather it in your hands and then pop it on your spot. Let it dry. Mm -hmm. Dries at the spot. And oh. Another good one is toothpaste. Put a bit of same, toothpaste. Same thing, yeah. Put a bit of toothpaste on your spot and just leave it. Yeah. Oh, toothpaste or soap, yeah. That's it. Mm. Just pop them. What about trepanning? That goes back to the fucking Stone Age. That is a surgical procedure involving a circular hole being drilled in the skull. Mm. And this is believed to let a demon out, curing madness. <laughs> bit mad, are you? Mad Bert. Bit mad. All right. Come over here. I've got the drill. See, mm -hmm. was it the back of the skull? It's the top of the skull. It's anywhere on the skull, really. Top of the skull, usually. Top of the skull is quite thin, isn't it? Because I suppose, like, they could... I... Well, it's basically lobotomising, isn't it? No, it's literally... They don't touch the brain. They just go through the skull. They say a piece of bone that was removed and was kept as a charm to ward off evil spirits. 
<laughs> I want to wear a piece of my own skull as a yeah. charm now. Well, I guess to a grave, probably have like someone else's. A necklace of it, wouldn't you? After a while, if you've been there at it enough time. <laughs> well, if you're mad enough. Yeah. <laughs> you've been out of school left. <laughs> That'd be the problem. A bit drafty in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my brain's cold. <laughs> Even during the Middle Ages, though, some recognised the ludicrousness of this procedure. Uh, the Dutch painter, Hieronymus Bosch, one of my favourite painters, actually. Yeah, he's good. Hieronymus Bosch. Mocks the procedure in one of his paintings, The Extraction of the Stone of Madness. Is that this painting? It is. It's just done by Bosch, then. Bosch. That's what he's cutting off someone's leg, is he? Yeah, but that's all. Just amputation, dismemberment, secure, remember? Dismemberment is the, was the term for surgical amputation, which was used to cure infected wounds. Because if you get an infection in that wound, you are fucked. Leg off, and you still may not survive at that. Yeah. Depends how quick the amputation's done, how quick the infection's noticed. Prior to the 17th century, amputation actually referred to a punishment for criminals. So I guess if you're a thief, I cut your hands off. That's amputation. Still do. Surgical it in some term. Now. Do. Mm. Surgical term is dismemberment. Some countries are allied with us. Hmm. The owners of Newcastle United. <laughs> and the ones. For anaesthesia purposes, like we said, it's either a potentially hazardous herb, like a deadly nightshade or a wolf bane, or booze, or a blow to the head. That's your choices. I'll probably take the booze and the blow to the head. Then give, a, give me a bottle of brandy, and then hit me on the head with something. I'll go with that. Mm-hmm. Medieval surgeons obviously had no concept of sterilisation, and the patient often got infected from the surgery. After the limb was removed, the leg was cauterised to stop the bleeding, and if the patient did survive the anaesthetic, infection and surgical procedure, they were often mentally traumatised for life. <laughs> you would be! Um, That's terrible. It's kind of no surprise, is it, really? No. No, it isn't. I mean, especially if they don't give you the booze. No. And they just, like I say, a minute to get the leg off. Now, a minute isn't a long time, is it? No. But it is when someone's sawing through your fucking flesh with probably not a very sharp saw. No. You know, don't think this thing's like, he's bought a new one just for the job where he's had it sharpened. Now that's overheads. If that'll do three legs before he has to get it resharpened, and you're the four. third guy, <laughs> <laughs> that ain't got to be sharp. <laughs> Maybe he does more than three. Who knows? And plus you've got the germs from the other two. That's like it. The legs chopped off is still on the blade. Yeah, you know, it would be a very rare barber surgeon or surgeon or anyone at this point that washed their tools. Surely they just... just what, you know. under the tap? There ain't no running water. No. But remember as well, because this also runs into another fact, that medieval hygiene in particular was not exactly fantastic. No. Remember, medieval town in England. Shit all over the road. Human excrement, cow and pig excrement. And horse. Piss, straw, horse. Bodies. You, blood, if you live downtown from the uh, slaughterhouse. Yep. Sounds nice, I can have visit. <laughs> well, for that, Mike, you'll need time travel. <laughs> but then or just go down to Brookside on any average Saturday night. There would have been bodies and things like that around. And yeah, there'd be people drunk in the street. There'd be dead bodies. Yeah. There'd be yeah, dead yeah, animals. Be respectful, you, you know. And well, the okay, house. Well, the house is not exactly clean, but there's straw on the floor. It's like the old Iron Horse pub. Yeah. <laughs> straw on the floor and that bare concrete, bare stone. There's rats. There's fleas. There's lice. No one. People are are washing like. If you were rich, if you were rich and considered a bit fucking feminine, you might wash once a month. The King of England, some King of England during the plague was mocked for washing once a month. <laughs> Come which king it was. You know, it was just, oh, it was crazy. You, know, you might go for a dip in the river now and again, but the soap they had was that coarse that it actually rubbed your skin raw. Oof. Had salt in it. I thought they'd be, always be in the, the river No, No, they wouldn't bathe that often. Not in this it was his country. Once every couple of oh, months. Or if you're one of the guys whose job it is to fish the turds out the fucking river and you have to get in there, then yeah, you're probably going to have a dip further up, you know, further downstream on a little tributary or something, aren't you? It was that job. People did it, Mike. <laughs> People did it. They sat him by the roadside. No, that was their job. They had to fish the shit <laughs> out of the fishermen. Yeah. Where did they have to put it? 
Fresh turds. Get your night soil. Get your fresh like turds. <laughs> Two groats a turd. Put them on a stick. Two groats? That's a fucking rip off. <laughs> put them on a stick and sold them as kebabs. <laughs> Turkish kebabs. People did it. Turkish, Turkish kebabs. People had to get on night soil men. You'd have to go into the night soil pits where with people would throw their shit and piss, and then I think and clean it out. It was it was revolting. But they'd bathe every day, obviously. <laughs> or maybe some of them didn't. I don't know. But again, my, public my toilets were pretty much non-existent. If there was a bridge, you'd there'd be public toilets built into that, so you'd shit directly into the river. Yeah. But there was alleys and things like that called Piss Alley and things like that. In London, there's still alleyways called Piss Alley. You don't want to be living down but in, in Paris. Alleyways. In Paris, there is literally a pee pee street. Yeah. You can be in some medieval English towns ankle deep in all of that. Oh. Yep. We painted quite a picture of this. We are. It's fucking grim, mate. That took us yeah. a, good, a good five minutes to. Get that description across, didn't it? Really, so. I, I felt it needed the elaboration. How fucking grim it is! I hope nobody's eating the tea. Yeah. yeah. If you're eating your dinner or your lunch or whatever you want to call it, we do apologise. If it's all over your screen now, <laughs> don't send us the bill. <laughs> but obviously, there was herbal treatment, right? And this obviously goes back to stuff we'd learnt and had been kind of wiped out, and then people started going, "Oh, you know what? Them wires have been on to something." The wise woman. The wise woman. The wise woman. There's wise persons. No, it's usually a wise woman. The wise woman. Blackout, isn't it? You don't need to talk to me like that. I'm not a tourist. (laughs) (laughs) Purple flowers. A medieval way of thinking. Anything that had purple flowers had to work. Do you know why? Purple was seen as a colour of royalty. Purple cloth was incredibly expensive. The only way you could make purple cloth... It was a special dye from a shellfish. Yeah. That is the only the very wealthy can afford purple. Shellfish color. bastards. Yeah. Therefore, anything purple had to work. Therefore, anything purple <laughs> because it's there. It works because it's obviously rich and luxurious and great. You know, I, I like that actually. Even though they gave the plants scary names like deadly nightshade and wolfsbane, and were aware of their poisonous properties. They continued to use them as remedies because they were purple. But Doctor, everyone seems to be dying still. Purple. <laughs> it all work out in the end. <laughs> that guy over there is having a fit. Purple. <laughs> Give him some more wolf spade. What about this lavender? This pet's pur- not purple enough. <laughs> <laughs> not the right kind of. But it's really good. No. <laughs> no. Belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, as purple flowers and blackberries, and has been used for its medicinal poisonous, psychoactive and cosmetic purposes. Apparently in medieval Europe, witches use belladonna to make a hallucinogenic brew. Eh, makes sense. When I say witches, I say like, you know... Herbalists. Yeah. Witches are also said to have created a flying ointment out of belladonna, opium, poppy, monkshood and poison hemlock. You fancy getting high tonight and flying? Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly where to get poison hemlock for and monkshood. Do you know what? Opium poppy. Yeah, I could probably find some there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Belladonna. I've got some of them in my back garden. Italian noble women used belladonna droplets to dilate their pupils, which was seen as a sign of beauty. However, overuse of the droplets would lead to blindness. Oh, shit. What? Macbeth. Of Scotland. Well, he was, uh, he was a fictional character, but yeah. Tried to use it to poison the English army. He did use it to poison the English oh. army. Now, as a medicine, belladonna was used as a pain reliever and anti-inflammatory. Unlike other questionable medieval practices, belladonna is still actually used today as a medicine. Although instead of gathering wild belladonna leaves and roots, people usually uh, cultivate it now for one of its alkaloids, uh, which is an anti-spasmodic. Is that how I say that? Anti-spasmodic? I think yeah, so. Yeah, pretty much. Fantastic. I thought you were making a spaz. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> it's basically um, fitting. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's the fitting compulsive. Convulsing. Convul- no, I was just looking at my just convulsing. sort of convulsing. unwokeness. Mm. It was tragic. Yeah, it stops convulsions, basically. Yeah, yeah. School cap, a lavender-coloured plant that was used to cure headaches. It seeds are thought to resemble tiny schools, that's pretty yeah. metal. Mm. Ooh. 
That's kind of creepy. In medieval medicine, if a plant resembled a part of the body, it was thought to be good at treating uh, any ailment that affected that body part. The school trap was used to treat headaches. I see. It's one of those ones with a big cone on the end of these. <laughs> <laughs> Noses. Warts. Nosebleeds. Uh. <laughs> this practice, I think, in the A, if it looks like that part of the body, it's clearly meant to, to treat it. So do you think it would cure leaky dick then? Well, the yeah, cold man. one. <laughs> I'll try it. Depends to why do you want to stretch your ring? Everything else has failed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find some for you. Here you go. We'll let you know next week, listeners. Lily's a highly toxic one. Don't, don't be sticking don't, up with Japs either. Don't, don't, don't yeah. be rubbing no. Yeah, don't be rubbing them around your cock. No, I do. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's shaped like a cock, it must fix a cock. <laughs> I'm not showing you my cock. Again. Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> yeah, not twice in one week. <laughs> He's got to give you something to look forward to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got to wait till next Monday now. I can't have ski sex on the deal of the Queen Bee. Why well, is that when they say it is? <laughs> next Monday? Yeah. Is that the 19th? Yes, I think yeah, so. Okay. The day my course starts, typically. Yeah, you can say it in the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so that practice, like knowing, hey, just because it looks like that must cure it, is the doctrine of signatures, and thus thought to be a guide from God. Does it make sense? I suppose I can understand where you would make that connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about monkshood or wolfsbane? Wolfsbane's a pretty cool name. I yeah. Like that, yeah, yeah. That's used as a pain reliever, sedative, and anaesthetic. When applied to the skin, it eventually paralyzes the nerves. It is a dangerous anesthetic to use because it is poisonous. In Asia, hunters and warriors tip their arrows in poison derived from wolfsbane to kill bears and other enemies. That's pretty fucking cool. Mm. Cool, it must be quite potent if it's killing bears. Mm. Well, you'd be like fucking dipping that shit in, wouldn't you? Dipping that spear point in or arrowhead. Taken orally, wolfsbane numbs the nerves and slows the heart rate to a dangerously low level. A large enough dose can cause instantaneous death. So I bet there's a few sort of bit of experimentation going on there. Yeah. Even handling the leaves with bare hands can cause poisoning that affects the heart. Hmm. Uh, so modern medicine has abandoned it. This is a, rem- a highly toxic plant. Lungwort. Treat the lungs by any chance? <laughs> yeah, they were used to treat infections of the lungs and cause coughs or breathing problems. Because it's purple and it's called lung ward. It looks like a lung. Mm. That causes liver damage. Uh. Tooth ward. Toothache? Yeah, obviously. Doesn't say if that killed you. May have worked, may not have. Rosemary. That's if your wife's called Rosemary and she's being a pain in the arse. Uh-huh. A rosemary is a flowering plant that is part of the mint family and it was sometimes used to make teas which are thought to cure many illnesses or reeds. Reeds? Never heard that before. No, me neither. Rosemary is one of the few medieval remedies that isn't highly toxic and in fact remains a popular <laughs> flavouring though in medieval Europe many superstitions mm. surrounded it. So... I think that's what... It's that sweet that... Turkish delight. Yeah. That's, that's not rosemary, that's rose. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's also in a purple wrapper, which means it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fries Turkish Yeah, delight. fries it's Turkish delight. Like, it is nice, though. I do like real Turkish delight. What's the difference? Fries is nasty. Is it? Yeah, compared. And Turkish, all Turkish delight's nasty, I don't like yeah. any of it. Uh, you get nice flavoured ones, you get a nice lemon one, that's beautiful. Oh, oh Turkish delight. Turkish delight's lovely. I've always been a big fan of Turkish delight. It's always one of the go-to gifts friends and family get me. Is that I'll a get, hint? We'll get, we'll get pizza. Get pizza from Turkish Delight. No, it's like, oh, what do we get for Christmas? I'll give some Turkish Delight. Or for then a holiday or something. we we'll come back with some fancy Turkish Delight for me. You'd sell out your friends to the Queen then, wouldn't you? What? Isn't that? <laughs> the kid likes Turkish Delight, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe. Lion Witch yeah. in the Wardrobe. <laughs> well, remember, guys, Turkish Claire, Delight. Mike... If we ever got a Narnia, don't trust Pete. <laughs> Especially if he's got white powder around his face. <laughs> it's not cocaine. <laughs> it's Turkish Delight! You sold us out, you fucker! <laughs> Get him, Aslan! <laughs> it's 
sick him. Sick him. <laughs> my name's Peter, so surely I'd be the, the main king anyway. Well, I don't know. You've got a weakness for Turkish delight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've got a weakness for blonde bitches as well, so... <laughs> Sorry, the Queen's dark-haired. <laughs> Obviously, many, you have many superstitions surrounding Rosemary. It was thought to improve the memory... It was used as a poppet stuffing to cure illness of poppet stuffings. And they're popping it. <laughs> <laughs> like the Native American dream catcher, a sprig of rosemary placed under the pillow could dispel nightmares. It was said that the rosemary would not grow in the gardens of evil people. <laughs> and it was grown outside the home so that home would be protected from witches. What lady bollocks! <laughs> All right, they didn't use just purple plants though, there was other stuff. Mandrake, an aphrodisiac, a cure-all, and for its hypnotic properties. Also known to be poisonous, though. But medicinally, it was used to cure gout and insomnia, and heal wounds, and as an anaesthetic. Don't according listen to its screams. Although, of course, Harry Potter says, and this is true, of clearly, according to the Doctrine of Signatures, mandrake roots resemble an entire man or woman. So it was thought that mandrake roots were capable of shrieking if they were pulled from the ground, and that could drive a person mad and even kill them. It's the early version of date rape. Yeah. <laughs> Aphrodisiac and an anaesthetic. So it makes them horny and knocks them out. <laughs> Depends on the dosage. <laughs> what if you knock yourself out, it makes them horny. It looks like a man or woman and he shrieks when you pull it from the ground. It's date rape. <laughs> well, you know what, Mike? Why the, I bet someone used it for that. I'll guarantee you, yeah. someone at some point has at least tried. Because it was still valued as a cure-all, strange rituals were invented for safely harvesting mandrake root. One involved tying a dog to the plant to pull it up so the dog would die instead of the person. Oh, oh fucking hell! Poor dog. What a bunch Luckily. of cunt humans are. Yeah. Luckily. Bring on no. that giant asteroid right now, I've, seen, I've heard enough. No, luckily, no dogs died from pulling up a mandrake. But they did. Why didn't they use Arthur Mandrakes Ritic? Mandrakes don't really squeal and kill people. No, I'm not on... Yeah. Why didn't they use arthritic mice? <laughs> arthritic <laughs> mice? It's not going to pull out a mandrake, is it? Enough of them. <laughs> like 50, 50 little arthritic <laughs> mice. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to train those mice and make little yokes for them to carry to pull the thing. Little stirrups, little harnesses. Right? Yeah. What, 50 to 90 <laughs> mice? Arthritic mice? <laughs> yeah, so you're going to spend your evenings sewing 90 little harnesses for arthritic mice and round the mice up yeah. and make sure they've all got arthritis. And hope they'll survive long Well, time. it doesn't, doesn't matter, does it? Because they're going to go insane and die anyway. Uh, That's why I'm using the arthritic mice. They're almost dead. Okay. <laughs> it's just the logistics of this operation is our question. <laughs> That's, what, that's what, all. Uh, what about a rabid rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> you just go round them up. Unfortunately, the rabbit might bite you. You might become rabid yourself. Yeah. It's quite dangerous. In them days, they all had metal gauntlets. You'd been all right. There we go. Yeah. You've seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That was rabid. <laughs> <laughs> that had blokes in armour. That's kind of what made me think about it. <laughs> it's like little vision of Mike turning up to the mice bingo. Come on, come on, you're arthritic enough. The mice bingo? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> to get all the blue perm mice. mice. Yeah, <laughs> I got them. <laughs> Going around the mice old people's homes, <laughs> yeah. rounding them up. You're fucking worse. You're like the mouse Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> working those people, to, humor working those people to death. <laughs> working those mice to death. They're almost dead anyway. <laughs> What's well, so a euthanasia is fine, is it? <laughs> Working them to death is fine. <laughs> Got a bleak dystopian view to the most population's got. I'm sure that's so what it went the, from uh... that to getting tested on, didn't it? Mm, exactly. Well, I guess so. Being a mouse sucks, doesn't it? It does. There's poor mice and pulling out them mandrakes. Yeah, all right, henbane. Nothing to do with hens, though. No chickens involved. It's a yellow plant that was popular with witches and also used as a sedative and an anodyne. What's that? I have no idea. No. <laughs> Him as a science officer, I've got no clue. But I'm guessing it's got something to do with hallucinations, because it's used to give hallucinations of flying. Ooh. Mm. So to make an anaesthetic, it was combined with deadly nightshade, mandrake and datura. It is also poisonous on its own and not used in medicine. 
today. The moonflower, Datura, is a hallucinogenic poisonous plant with white flowers, which is used Datura to make flight ointments, so it's more hallucinogenic, and love potions. Again, probably more hallucinogenics. You go up to the girl you love tripping on acid, declare your love for her, probably do some kind of dance, skirting your tits off. Uh, <laughs> if you think... in the face and he died of poison. Yeah. Anodyne is a painkiller. Uh, you think of anodyne. Uh, mm. No way. Been a proper school day today. Yeah. yeah. The seeds or leaves were dripped into a fermented drink which Dropped. caused visual hallucinations. It was sought to cure insomnia, deafness and fever. And if it does put a person into a sleeping state, it actually causes hyperthermia. If a person survives, they usually feel pain when looking at bright light for several days and experience amnesia. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right, Mike. Mm. Don't rip drug. I'd have gone with that one for the amputation, wouldn't you? Well, yeah. You then, forget it all. Yeah, you forget it all, that, you know. Yeah, but you're hallucinating while they're chopping your leg off. But the barber surgeons ain't using that shit. This is what you get as a peasant. Is, you know, the, the wise woman gives you it. The wise woman. The wise woman. <laughs> <laughs> Put it yarrow. A soldier's wound wart or blood wart. Yarrow was commonly used to treat knights who were wounded in battle. And this treatment was actually effective because the flowers do help to clot blood. Yay! When pressed against a wound... Yes, that, that one actually works, you won't yeah. I was saying mm. earlier about the pack wounds with leaf yeah. and things, if that would have been That's it. the leaf that they'd have used, it would have been that, with petals or whatever. Claire, go on, do liverwort. Liverwort is a small plant that was used to treat the liver as a prescribed by a doctrine of signatures. So it looks like a liver. Cool. So therefore, it God's the put that there mm -hmm. to cure the liver. Modern science found no validity in treating the liver with liverwort, but liverwort does have does, does serve. serve a purpose for decorating aquariums in the modern world. Yay! Like most medieval remedies, liverwort can also be used as a poison. Yay! Wormwood. So wormwood is a bitter-tasting plant, perhaps best known as an ingredient in absinthe. Absinthe. Nice. Ah, okay. But. Before that, it was used to make tea that treats intestinal parasites. You know what? Probably works, and absinthe's pretty fucking strong, mm -hmm. isn't it? It'll probably kill anything in your gut. <laughs> Unlike other medieval uh, remedies, wormwood may have some valid medical properties. It inhibits the growth it inhibits. of it inhibits the growth of bacteria, yeast, and some herbalists believe that the fungus helps to treat. Athlete's foot and ringworm. Disclaimer, consult with the doctor first. Yeah, yeah. Don't be putting some wormwood on your old bacterial yeast infections. Uh, it also mm -hmm. works well at treating malaria. So that's what it's used for today still. Mm. Fantastic. So that's pretty cool. Don't stick it on your ringworm. Yeah. Well, your ring piece. <laughs> I was going to say yeah. that. Medieval remedies, right, we'll do a quick guide to a cure-all. Now, if you've got any disease in medieval Europe, you want either a mandrake root, bloodletting, sage, rosemary tree, or vervain, which is a sprig of purple flowers. <laughs> For madness, you need a bag full of buttercups worn around the neck. Oh, that'll work. Bloodletting or trepanning. Oh! That's a trepanning. <laughs> <laughs> you go screaming in the street. That's a trepanning. <laughs> <laughs> So for insomnia, you'd need a, a mixture of nettles and egg whites, mandrake root, datura and saffron. Kind of sounds tasty. Mmm. Mmm. So the nettles. <laughs> well, the, the mandrake root's going to... Oh, nettle tea, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to yeah, be nettle, nettle tea. tea. Mm. The mandrake root would knock you out, wouldn't it? That's what that does. Provided the dose is right, it doesn't kill you. <laughs> so for a fever, you use datura, angelica, chamomile and coriander seeds. With a cough, you go for lungwort, whorehound, <laughs> penny royal, or oh, penny royal tea, the Nevada yeah. song, and honey oregano. Ooh. That Sounds might right. actually work, you yeah. Know. Nightmares, rosemary placed under the pillow. Ooh, rosemary, eh? Mm. Oh, probably a bit of lavender as well to help you sleep. I was just thinking of some bird called rosemary, sorry. She's going to be under my pillow, is she? Oh, oh la, Rosie. Oh, yeah. 
For anaesthetics, you'd use a Deadly Nightshade, Monk's Hood, Henbane, Mandrake Root, Opium, Gall of Boar, <laughs> or Cloves. So you say, hey, you're that boar, can I have the gall bladder? Cloves are slightly anaesthetic, because if yeah. you chew on them, say you've got toothache, they, it, it can, you know. Oil of cloves, isn't it, you yeah. get? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So for headaches, you'd use a skull cap, boiled heather, chamomile, lavender, rose hip tea. Stomach ache is mint, oregano and ginger. Which is still very well known today. All three of those. Maybe not so much oregano, but mint and ginger. I don't know, I just, I've never really used dinner in the stomach ache. And, or ready, maybe a ready, something like that. I don't know what to do. Ginger's them. really good for upset stomach. I don't even think I've got ginger in the air, so I don't really have stomach ache, so I've never really had to try anything. Chop a bit of ginger up into a couple of little pieces, stick it in water, in a bottle of something. Drink it and it, it tastes lovely as well. It's it good. gives a well, nice. sickness as well. They said chew on a piece of ginger or ginger nut biscuit. Yeah, mm. it's just good for an upset stomach. Well, I do like a ginger nut biscuit. Mm. Mm. Dipped in milk. Yeah, man. Oh, it's just on its own. The know. milk's not so good though with an upset stomach. Oh, I might no. get some ginger nuts tomorrow. Mm. Ooh. Chest pains, yeah. mortician. Because <laughs> I can guarantee you that mint and parsley and boiled in wine is not going to save you. Well, no. for a heart attack, yeah. Who the chest pain is? <laughs> if you've got a bit of melancholy, you just get a bit of lemon balm. A sniff. Can't see that working. Myrrh. Oh, sorry. Lemon, but melancholy isn't lemon balm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, lemon drizzle cake could cheer me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Not sure they had access to cakes back then. They had cakes. They must have had cakes. They had bakers, didn't you? They made bread. They might have, I don't know, actually. I don't know. I went sugar. Yeah, nah, I, don't, I, reckon they, cakes, I reckon they, they had cakes. I reckon they had cakes. I reckon they had They had cakes. Because you, you only need to watch plebs. And that was set in Rome. Like, in like... Yeah, we can't look at plebs as an accurate historical record. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought it was. I thought that was like... It's not taking the, the writings of Plebius. I thought, it was, I thought it was like genuine fact, like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so if, you, if you've got wounds, you can, you can use myrrh and yarrow, whatever the fuck yarrow is. And if you've got a burn or a snake bite, you can use St John's wort. Don't they use that for depression? No, no, they... they As well, you can buy St John's wort tablets yeah, today. Yeah. I'm sure you can. Yeah. I know St John's ambulance, but... That's where it come from. It's all part to do with that, is it? No, I just made that up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you sounded convincing enough to me, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Pete, you you believe Sasquatch hunters? <laughs> I don't believe Sasquatch hunters. I believe that it could be. <laughs> Pete just need Burgess. Pete just need Burgess face up with his do light. <laughs> <laughs> Explains it. <laughs> Listen, you have to just imagine the surprise look on Pete's face then. Get the St. John's Ward. Yeah, well, give, they get that man some St. John's Ward immediately. <laughs> Alright, so if you are a medieval doctor, you've got a lot if to contend If you are a medieval doctor, like there's loads of them about <laughs> yeah. still. I've seen plenty of plague doctors around on Halloween. If you were a medieval doctor, you've got a lot to contend with. As you mentioned, there's like lots of unsanitary conditions, people aren't bathing, there's no anaesthetic, so you get a simple a simple cut on your finger could effectively kill you through gangrene if your fingers or hands aren't taken off quick enough. Mm. There's a lot of skin disease as well. Yeah. Do you ever black out a ploppy son of ploppy, the jailer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We really, truly, sir, you're lucky. We live in an age where illness, sickness, and deformity are rife, but you are the most disgusting individual I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go through a few. The Black Death literally killed a third of the population of Europe, transmitted through fleas of the common ratus ratus. That's the Latin for rat, by the way. Ratus ratus. Lazy in it. <laughs> Lazy. It is literally, it, it all started, it started in the East. There is some thought that it started with hamster fleas. Pet hamster fleas. So hamsters, so little little Mr Nibbles there with his 
puffy little cheeks. I don't think they were keeping them as hamsters back then. They'll have been little wild hamsters. They would have been, but know. people might have kept them as pets. I can't see it. Might have, you don't know. They got other problems. No one got time for that shit. No, see, back then. <laughs> <laughs> people have always had pets, Claire. Mm. We've had dogs, hunting dogs, security dogs, herding think, dogs, cats they have just to laze around and look at us disdainfully. They didn't have hamsters though. They might have had hamsters, you don't know. Mm, I don't People, think so. Rose had pet snakes, they might have had, you know, oh, I want one of them, give, give me one of them. I'm not saying there's pet shops and stuff, but you know, uh, some little, maybe you know, some little princesses like, oh they're cute, I want one of them, daddy get Daddy, one. I want one. I want one, only oh, send his guards to trap you one, he's got a pet hamster there, gives the plague. <laughs> And the princess has got it. Every commoner wants it. Of course. And they all get the plague. Daddy, Daddy, I want the plague. The princess has it. <laughs> and they all oh, get the plague. hamster. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> all get the plague as well. Oh, the plague's fucking nasty, though, because it's just not just the bubonic. The bubonic takes like two or three days to kill you, maybe a week tops. There's one called cephalactic shock. Cephalactic. You do the blood poisoning, basically. It'll kill you in 24 hours, less. There's a story of like a monk stayed in an inn with a family and he's like, and they went to bed like, like 10 o'clock. When he woke up in the morning at dawn, they're all dead. All dead of the plague. Whoa. It's probably better though, isn't it? It's quicker. Oh, fuck yeah. When the plague first started, it started to come into Europe via trading vessels, but the Mongols actually, because they're fucking badass, utilised it as a weapon. When they besieged Kaffa, a city in present-day Ukraine, they loaded the dead and dying bodies of soldiers who were infected with the plague onto the carports, yeah. launched yeah. them over the city walls to infect those behind. Because if they come all too sick to man the walls, we can fucking take this place. Yeah. Biological weapons. Yeah. They do it all the time. If they caught an enemy patrol, an enemy patrol inside the walls, heads off in a sack over the wall. Spreads disease. Because, you know, we talked about the plague doctors. Who actually noticed that, that it was the, the fleas in the end? Oh, we, we found out that went later on. That mm. was like a lot later. Hundreds of years later. Yeah, when we, when we figured out germology. and Because remember, the black death hasn't gone away. It hadn't gone away. It's it pretty hasn't. rare nowadays. Yeah. It's still about. It's still about. But the last major epidemics, we discovered germ theory at that point, And obviously, we can treat it now. It's pretty much non-lethal. Well, mm. can be pretty much non-lethal if you treat it. I'd say if it's untreated... Oh, you, you probably chances are you, might, you, you may well die from it. Yeah. Well, some people do have a natural immunity. we probably all got a degree of natural immunity to it now because of it, it had to die out through natural immunity. Mm. So Well, or it just kills too fast. That's the problem with the, pla the Black Plague at the time, the bubonic Plague. Killed too fast, it was Didn't ravaging have time for itself to survive. Societies, no more host to infect, and they had you killed everyone who could infect. Mm. The ones that did survive, obviously, they passed on their genes to us, and that's why yeah, some people um, are weirdly immune. Poland was not very affected by the plague. Mm -hmm. Polish people seem to have some kind of natural immunity somewhere, mm -hmm. or it could be to do with the fact that the king of Poland at the time had a Jewish mistress who really liked cats. And because she was quite a popular figure, uh, a lot of people had cats to copy her. And of course, what do cats do? Kill rats. rats yeah. Could be that. There weren't as many rats around because mm. there was more cats. But ironically, that's why Poland had a large Jewish population, is because Jews were villainised. Because, let's face it, nothing new. It's a bit of a trend. In the medieval period, Jews were villainised. They thought Jews had poisoned the wells. Jews, lepers and gypsies were persecuted during this time because many believed that they were spreading the plague. Jews have always been persecuted because, in, especially in Roman Catholic terms, Roman Catholic medieval terms, Jews killed Christ. They're the ones that gave him up. Uh, yeah. That's to blame for everything. That's what I mean. So, they've always been victimised across Europe, medieval period, and of course the Holocaust. But the prejudice has always been there from fucking day one Late because party. of religion. So Poland, because the king of Poland is actually quite fond of Jewish people, his mistress is Jewish, he sort of had an amnesty for them, let them in. Okay. Which sadly is, is why Poland had a larger Jewish population than most of the countries in Europe when World War II rolled around. Mm. But 
Let's see. She liked cats. Saved a lot of people. Flagellants were a bunch of religious fanatics who went around whipping themselves in atonement for mankind's sins. It was kind of like a show. They'd do like they come into town singing and whipping themselves, and they do like three shows a day, <laughs> rotate the guys through. I'm whipping. Yeah, whipping. Yeah, singing, praying, everybody to gather around to watch them. They were banned from England. The king of the time thought they were just lunatics and didn't like that kind of religious frenzy. So he said, nope, if I find any flagellants in the country, you will be killed. Don't like you. But Germany, they were very, very, very popular. A lot of this really took off in, in modern day Germany. German that doesn't area. surprise me. Oh, we'll have a big <laughs> <here>. yeah. <laughs> We love the violence. Wilhelm brings the whip. <laughs> Don't forget the leather stockings. <laughs> think of today when we think the end is nigh yeah and we're all on this apocalypse spiral today aren't we nowadays they had exactly the same thing in the middle ages when the play was happening this is the end this yeah, is the yeah. apocalypse people were like writing on church walls in paint as they like, lay there because they gone to the church to basically try and get medical care they ended up on death's door everyone around them dead and they wrote like if this is life it's a joke on the wall. Yeah. It's crazy they would write stuff like that. People found graffiti. <laughs> they were saying about the pointlessness of existence or an empty godless universe. That's when you realise that we've always been the same. It's always going to be the end. Yeah. We'll do a proper full blown. But it might be like a three part or into the Black Death because it's a major thing and it's there's a lot of mental shit went on. Like people used to see Grim Reapers thrashing the wheat outside of the town and then after that town will be affected by the plague mm. with the miasmas mm. crazy medieval remedies for the black death however were consisted of a bath of vinegar and rose water lancing the bew boys which was kind of found out towards the end bloodletting which he just did from the start a burning incense made of rosemary garlic mustard or four thieves vinegar which is a concoction of vinegar infused with herbs and spices Without lancing them bew boys, you're pretty much dead. I wonder if it was real vinegar and not the shit that they serve in chip shops today. You know what? I was devastated when I found that out. It wasn't proper vinegar anymore, the chippy. What? What is nope. it? It's a mixture of imitation vinegar. Yeah. It's safer, cheaper to transport, it's easier to produce, just tastes like vinegar. Yeah. You probably not having proper vinegar. So, is it still got the acidity or alcohol? You know, nope, it's just there for the taste. Ah. I don't even like the vinegar, so... Cut in it. Leprosy. That is an infection. That we all know lepers, don't we? Those lovable rogues from most... Lepers, yeah. All them Bible films. Bits and bodies falling off here That's and there. It, uh, it's an infection that infects the nerves, skin, eyes and nose. Lepers experienced severe social stigma in the medieval era before being persecuted for supposedly spreading the Black Death. They were isolated in lepers' colonies and treated with mercury. No. You don't want to be treated with mercury. No. We've decided this is going to be a two-parter. Mercury's going to come next week. Leprosy ain't around then. Leprosy is not around now because we know what causes it and we've got antibiotics and antivirals. It's still around yeah, now. It's still around, yeah, it's still around. It is, now. but it's, you'd be not treated now, can't it? Yeah, but there's poor countries that yeah, yeah. afford it, can they? Your Africa's mm. and your India's and mm. Pakistan, you find there's leprosy still in those yeah. countries and... Well, you know, they all go round in that sackcloth with the hoods and ringing a bell, letting everyone know they're coming. Yeah, they still do that now. <laughs> do they? I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me in some places. Hopefully not. Some people believe that lepers are going through purgatory on Earth. I like that. I like that theory. Well, I don't like it. <laughs> it's just Gosh. like, I like that exploration in a medieval... If I'm thinking like a medieval person... Oh wow, those guys are getting straight to heaven because they haven't got to the purgatory. Look, I'm suffering now. Imagine their, their conversations in the tavern. They're, they're like super dim. Well, he saw a bill today. You know, the, he more than likely, his nose. someone died. You know, did you hear that so and so died? More than likely. Oh, you hear the plague's coming closer. Oh, there's going to be a war, you know. Another strange treatment for leprosy was baths of blood or beverages made of blood. Yeah. And sometimes lepers were also treated with snake venom and bee stings. Yeah. Fucking letting loose... No, what do we show our bees? Letting loose a venomous snake on a poor leper. <laughs> and then placing him next to a 
beehive and whacking the hive and say, stay there, this will treat you. Basically, they were being used as lab rats. <laughs> like they were. Well, you'd yeah. want anything to treat you, wouldn't you? Back then, you'd just be like, I don't want Yeah, to but you're suffering up. leprosy and then some cunt wants to let a snake fucking bite you. Well, you're going to die anyway. A couple of hundred bees sting you. you know, it's I'd rather the snake bite me than the bees. It doesn't work, obviously, does it? Well, no, it's still be doing it today. You like shit as it is, and you get stung by hundred bees. Fucking hell! <laughs> right, Saint Anthony's fire. People caught Saint Anthony's fire for eating rye that was infected by a fungus. Today, this is known as ergot poisoning. We've talked about this before. Well, ergot is a hallucinogenic. Saint Anthony's fire is like a monstrous version of the modern flu. In addition to headaches, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, Saint Anthony's fire also induced psychosis, spasms, and gangrene in the fingers and toes. St. Anthony's fire had a 40% mortality rate and was more common near marshy areas. Hmm. <laughs> You've got to be game. glad that's yeah. not around anymore. Yeah, that's, that's fun. That's not, that's not fun. There's ergot in it. It's, we don't have that anymore. Smallpox. Who wants smallpox? Not me. Smallpox was known as the Red Plague. It became most prevalent during the Crusades and had a 30% mortality rate, more amongst kids. Mm. Yeah. Smallpox causes a distinctive rash. Popular Japanese medieval belief where a smallpox demon seems to have been repurposed in Europe, where the demon was believed to be afraid of the colour red, so a smallpox patient's room was decorated in red. Patients also wore red clothing. If the infected person survived, smallpox often left behind severe scarring. I don't think smallpox is eradicated today, is it? Was it Queen Victoria who had the um, pox scars? I honestly... No, Queen Elizabeth, I think, maybe. No, it was Queen Victoria. I'm I have no sure. idea. I'd... I'm pretty sure it was the one they did in Blackadder. Queen Elizabeth, then. First. Is that Elizabeth I? Yeah, but yes. she wore the lead-based makeup yes. that ate into your face. And that was because she was covering severe pox scars, apparently. Mm. If it was even a... The real Queen Elizabeth, and not a castrated boy. <laughs> it's actually a genuine conspiracy theory. Is it? Yeah, I was saving it. We'll get into it one day. But yeah, there's a conspiracy theory that Elizabeth was not a woman. Mm. The first, not the second. Elizabeth the first. The one with the really bad teeth. Elizabeth the first. Yeah. Yeah. So you. Yeah, on that, so on that bombshell. On that bombshell. <laughs> on that bombshell. Boom. We shall end the show. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for listening. I've been Ben. Don't drink the flavour aid. Don't join a call. And follow us on Facebook at Cutting the Bone, the Post to the Apocalypse. SoundCloud and other podcasting platforms on Cutting the Ball and the PTA. And on YouTube as Apocalypse Ball. And join us for next week. And join us for next week's part two. I've been Mike, thanks for listening. Peace out, may the force be with you. And I've been Claire, keep an open mind, but not so open that it spills out your ears. And I've been Pete, aim low, but shoot high.